Good afternoon and welcome to this lunchtime's session looking at the accessible information regulations and the grant that's available for operators. Uh, we are recording this uh, and I'll make the uh, recording available to you uh, over the next couple of days uh, along with the slides. Um, please do feel free to ask questions uh, i'll give a few uh, opportunities while we're uh, going through it for uh, for, for q a on what we've just been uh, talking about i am expecting a few more to join us over the next few minutes um so what i'll cover this afternoon is uh, why the regulations have been brought in uh, a look at the regulations and what they mean for uh, operators in particular, um, then talk about the grant and then um, uh, Q&A. But as I say, uh, I'll um, uh, give a few opportunities as we go through rather than just at the end. So why are the accessible information regulations being brought in? Uh, travel is a high anxiety experience process for a lot of people. Uh, if you've been in an area where uh, you've not been on a bus before, then there's a lot of uncertainty uh, around um, you know, which stop uh, do I get off at, uh, where am I, uh, particularly if it's dark and wet and the windows are steamed up and things like that. I'm sure you've uh, experienced that situation on a bus. Um, well, if you then try and put yourselves in the shoes of uh, somebody that's got um, a disability or impairment of some sort, then those anxieties increase. The need to know where you are um, becomes more diff uh, increases and it becomes more difficult to know where you are, where you've got uh, particularly a visual or um, a hearing impairment um, and uh, you're reliant on other passengers or the driver to remember to uh, tell you uh, when you get to your stop. 70% of visually impaired uh, respondents in a Guide Dog for the Blinds uh, survey back in 2014 uh, said that they'd missed the stop because the driver had forgotten to tell them uh, when to get off. Um, now, that's uh, a serious problem uh, for the people that um, miss the stop. Um, you can't, in a lot of ways, blame the driver because actually they're there to uh, make sure people are safe and to drive the bus safely. And they've got people getting on and off and it's quite difficult to remember everybody uh, and where they're, uh, they're getting off. Um, so um, in light of that, um, the um, guide dogs and a number of other uh, disability groups uh, put together a case to the Department of Transport um, and um, that led to these regulations. There'd been lots of conversations for many years uh, leading up to the uh, 2017 uh, Bus Service Act that introduced the regulations, um, but the um, Guide Dogs uh, survey uh, was quite um, instrumental in getting the Act uh, through the politicians. Um, now, it's nothing new, audio-visual information. Um, London, with the rollout of iBus uh, over 15 years ago now, uh, introduced it on every bus. Um, it's become something that's expected in London um, and um, rail have been uh, going along this path for uh, over 25 years. Any new rolling stock uh, that's been introduced into the rail fleet since 1998 has had to have audio and visual information on it. So it's not new. Um, it has a big impact on passengers. Um, when it is available um, and um, the department and politicians decided they did need to act because 
um, uh, outside of London, less than a third of vehicles in England uh, at the end of 2023 had audiovisual equipment on them. Um, Wales and Scotland fare slightly better, but only marginally. Um, and so there's a large proportion of the fleet that uh, isn't fitted with audiovisual information. Um, and so um, there was uh, clearly a need to address the failure in adoption. Uh, the regulations uh, require pretty much every local bus and coach service to provide audio announcements and visual information um, at key points along the route and we'll look at um, what those where those are and what you need to provide uh, as we go through um, as I say um, it's uh, pretty much every local bus and coach service um, if a service falls within the definition of local bus so uh, you pay a separate fare to uh, anybody else and you can get on and off within 15 miles of um, where you got on then you're a local bus service and in scope of the regulations um, there are some exemptions which we'll touch on uh, in a bit but um, the definition of local bus does bring into play uh, rail replacement services where they're for local branch lines and things like that. If you were going from Newcastle to London and only stopping at York or something like that, then that's not a local bus service. Um, but if it's uh, you know a local line where you've got lots of stations close together, then that does fall under these regulations. And so uh, coach style vehicles uh, come into um, scope of the regulations where they're being used um, rather than just uh, you know traditional uh, service bus type vehicles so as I say there are a few um, exemptions if it's a small bus less than 17 seats then um, that's exempt um, heritage vehicles um, that first used before 1973 are exempt um, if it's a excursion or a tour if you've if you're running a closed door home to school service so the general public can't get on um, then that's exempt but if it's a uh, school service that's registered and so in theory uh, general public can get on they may not want to uh, because it's full of uh, screaming kids but if they could in theory then it's in scope uh, we've talked about long distance um, demand responsive and community bus have got some exemptions although community bus type services only where the vehicle was used before October last year uh, so new vehicles are in scope of the regulations um, one of the um, big challenges is the way that the regulations are being introduced they're being introduced on a phased basis based on when a vehicle was first used for a local public service um, which actually is not as easy to define as you might think um, because you might have a vehicle that is 10 years old um, and only being used for closed door or work services or something like that and suddenly you're uh, starting to use it uh, for scheduled local bus services um, then you will come in scope earlier than you may otherwise have done so fundamentally any new buses after 1st of October this year so only a few weeks away are in scope from um, 1st of October um, so basically new vehicles need to have audiovisual equipment fitted uh, coming out of the factory it doesn't matter when you ordered it if you ordered it a couple of years ago and it's been in you know in the works backlog um, then uh, it is in scope and you need to make sure it's fitted as it uh, goes into service um, vehicles that are five years that have been used on um, 
services in the last five years are in scope and have to be fitted by October. Um, so there's really not very long now before uh, they need to be fitted. Uh, if it's uh, been used for the last 10 years, then you've got until October next year and the oldest vehicles you've got until uh, October 26. Um, but given the number of vehicles that need to still be fitted, um, even you know a a year um, to get ready is uh, going to be a challenge in some cases because of the uh, uh, ability of suppliers to fit. So um, the first use is a challenge, um, you know, because uh, nobody really keeps track of when it was first used for a particular type of service. Um, uh, so uh, it's worth uh, thinking about that if you've got vehicles that uh, could potentially be in scope. Um, a third of vehicles or similar, you know, around that um, had equipment on at the end of last year. Um, if you um, had equipment on, then you can claim partial compliance. If you don't meet all of the detailed requirements of the regulations um, uh, and if you don't meet all of those, but you meet that you but you are providing audio and visual information to uh, passengers, then you've got until October 2031 to uh, update the systems to fully comply. Um, and that's to uh ensure that the focus at least for the next few years is fitting vehicles that have got nothing on rather than uh having to uh you know update existing systems and things like that it's a way of focusing the investment onto uh vehicles that haven't got anything so um what do you need to do you need to provide um audio information to passengers uh, that's got to be loud enough to hear um, there is a technical requirement for it to be at least three decibels over the background noise for 51 percent of passengers but it can't be louder than 84 decibels uh, where does 84 decibels comes from that comes from health and safety at work legislation you can't expose uh, people to more than 84 decibels on a regular basis without taking some form of action to prevent that either through uh, providing hearing protection or reducing the noise um, that is actually a bit of a problem on some older vehicles um, particularly when they're going uphill and they're heavily laden um, and you're towards the back of the bus um, it has been measured uh, at greater than 84 decibels on a number of different types of vehicles. Um, so uh, so that is going to be a challenge for some people. Um, it's also um, got to be tested, not just sat in the depot with the vehicle idling. Um, the guidance uh, suggests, well, no, it, it says that the testing needs to take place at five and 20 miles an hour. So you know, trying to get some real world um, play into that to make sure that uh, it is loud enough and it is uh, intelligible. Um, as well as audio through speakers, um, there is a requirement to make sure the audio is available through induction loops. So these are the things that you might have seen in uh, banks, council offices and things like that. You'll often see a little symbol by the uh, by the counter um, in a lot of uh, venues and things like that. You might see the uh, the the blue sign with the with the ear and a T symbol um, that enables people with a hearing aid with um, a tele loop switch to switch it onto the T and rather than the audio coming through the microphone and picking up all the background noise and things like that, it gets straight into the hearing aid and the ear without any of that uh, background noise. Um, so you need a loop on the vehicle. Um, 
the regulations uh, require only the priority and wheelchair space to be covered by that loop. Um, sometimes um, it's actually easier to fit the loop on the whole floor plate of the vehicle rather than in that isolated area because of where panels are and things like that. Uh, but the minimum requirement is that priority and wheelchair space. Um, some operators are fitting an additional loop in the uh, in the entrance area for drivers and passengers as they're boarding to communicate privately um, without um, it being broadcast to the whole vehicle. Um, but that isn't a requirement of the regulation. That's something that uh, is encouraged, though. As well as audio, you need to provide the visual information. So you need a display of some sort. Um, that display has got to be visible unencumbered to at least 51% of seated passengers. Um, that's uh, ignoring anybody standing. Um, it is a challenge in some vehicle layouts because unencumbered means you haven't got grab rails in the way and things like that. Um, but um, so far, uh, I think every vehicle design, uh, it has been possible. Uh, without modification to the vehicles. It just takes a little bit of thinking sometimes. Um, there are requirements around the height of that information, the minimum height, um, and things like um, not using capital letters and trying to avoid scrolling and things like that. Um, it doesn't specify in the regulations any particular technology uh, because uh, these things move on over time and you don't want to constrain what people do, but the minimum assumption and the minimum that is needed is an LED type display. Um, some operators are fitting uh, TFT, so teletype displays uh, to enable them to provide additional information uh and branding and things like that so it fits with the with the vehicle style and the operator's branding and things like that um, there is an additional requirement for new vehicles that are first used after october this year and that is to make sure that when a wheelchair user is in the wheelchair bay that they can see the display now a lot of the time um, a wheelchair user when they uh, all seat belted in and, and locked into place they're actually facing rearwards which means that they won't be able to see a display that's facing backwards that the majority of passengers are going to use and uh, in that case then an additional display for the wheelchair user that is forward facing uh, and mounted some way along the, uh, the vehicle uh, is going to be needed um, that is only technically for new vehicles after October. Some operators are retrofitting vehicles. Some already had them on as part of their um, existing uh, AV installations. Um, so um, the information that you need to provide, um, you need to provide route information uh, at the start of the journey and uh, when passengers are boarding uh, and that needs to be enough information for them to know um, the name or the number of the service and where the journey is going so the final destination um, or if it's a circular service for example you know it's going clockwise or you know via the shopping center way round so that passengers when they're getting on they know it's the right route and which way they're going to know that it is the right uh, vehicle um, and before you get to the end of the route you need to alert passengers that you're approaching the final stop and they need to be ready to uh, to disembark um, and that alert at the end of the route is one of the things that a lot of existing audiovisual systems uh, don't support, um, which is one of the reasons for the uh, partial compliance derogation. Um, when the vehicle is uh, on its route, um, 
you need to provide information about the next scheduled stop place, not just where it is stopping because somebody's pressed the stop button or you've seen somebody with their hand out um, requesting a stop. Um, so it's every stop that the vehicle is scheduled to stop at. Um, so that needs to be um, provided long enough in advance for somebody to hear it, go, aha, that's the stop I want, and press the buttons uh, without the driver having to do a emergency stop, hopefully. Um, so uh, that takes a little bit of jiggery pokery sometimes, particularly where you've got a lot of stops in an urban environment, typically when you're heading out of uh, out of a town um, uh, you may be uh, traveling at you know close to 30 miles an hour you've got to stop every few hundred meters uh, that's not a lot of time to make that announcement um, and so uh, you know you might need to adjust when that announcement is made um, you um, also need to think about um, when that announcement is made if you're in a rural area um, and you've got you know a few kilometers between stops you, know, you might only be stopping in each village center for example what you don't want to do um, which you would need to do in a high density urban environment is you know as soon as the bus doors close and it starts to move off you announce the next stop if you did that in a rural area um, and a, a passenger might go, ha ha, that's the next stop for me. Uh, press the button and stand up and prepare to get off. But, you know, you've got a couple of kilometres, a couple of minutes to go around twisty, turny roads. You don't want somebody uh, stood up for that. So in those circumstances, you want to be uh, making that announcement much closer to the stop so that you aren't putting people into danger. Um, if you operate a route in Wales. Uh, bus services um, are subject to the Welsh Language Act if they are supported and subsidised. Um, and so you need to be providing uh, Welsh and English stop names. And there is a uh, project going on with Transport for Wales and the Welsh Assembly at the moment to sort out stop names more consistently uh, across Wales. Uh, and um, the regulations also expect the name of the stop that is announced and shown to be consistent with other information that a passenger uh, will be provided with. So if they've planned a journey online using an app, something like that, the name of the stop that comes up there should be the name of the stop that is announced so passengers uh, you know recognize it and know that that's where they want to be getting off um, there is quite a lot of debate sometimes between operators and authorities about stop names and things like that um, most places have some form of partnership in place uh, and uh, where there are uh, discussions about stop names that aren't being resolved. It's through that partnership that we're suggesting people uh, should go to get it resolved. Um, where you've got Hail and Ride, um, you need to uh, inform people that you're starting a Hail and Ride section and when it's ending. Um, and if it's a long um section of hail and ride um the recommendation is to provide some contextual information you know we're going through these crossroads or we're going through this village something like that to help people uh know a bit more about where they are at a given point in time um and before you announce start and end of hail and rides you need to have an alert um and the um, probably the biggest area where there is a ongoing challenge um, with meeting the regulations is diversion information. So when a bus is diverted, passengers need to know about it. They need to be told uh, 
uh, that there's a diversion and the vehicle is uh, not going to be stopping at some stops. Um, now, practically the only way you can do that in a lot of circumstances, you know, where you're when you go around the corner and find the police have closed the road or you know there's a burst water main or something like that is by some form of driver intervention and systems have a button for drivers to uh, make that announcement and display it on screen um, and um, there are times of course when you know that a diversion is going to be in place because it's pre-planned um, typically an operator may update information in journey planners and uh, to bods and and timetables you know if that diversion is going to be in place you know three or six months uh, you know a decent length of time but because of the requirement for drivers to intervene during a diversion um, uh, the advice is to uh, keep that route information much more up to date when you've got you know relatively short term diversions in place because that's just going to reduce the load on drivers uh, as well as improving general information so uh that is the uh regulations and the key bits on that has anybody got any questions about the regulations? No. OK. Um, one of the things to uh, think about with audiovisual information is that it's just it's more than just fitting. You can't just fit it and forget. Um, you not only need to keep route data up to date, um, uh, if you change a timetable and it's just the times that are changing, uh, these things aren't going to need to be updated. But if you change the route, then they are. So how are you going to do that? Um, we know from uh, experience of operators that have introduced this, passengers are not going to be shy about coming forward if information is wrong or a stop name is pronounced incorrectly or something like that so uh, operators are going to need to put in place uh, ways of reporting for passengers um, in reality a lot of the time it's going to come through a driver um, so you know how do drivers uh, make these reports about inaccuracies and changes that need to be made uh, in an easy way because they're not going to do it otherwise uh, and uh, if information continues to be wrong then we know that affects passenger satisfaction um, the displays it's quite easy for somebody to see whether they're working or not as part of a quick you know walk around check in the morning and things like that likewise a driver is going to notice if the speakers fail um, they're probably going to go, ah, oh, peace and quiet. Um, but, uh, you know, they're going to notice. So, you know, how do they report faults? Um, but they're quite easy to deal with. What's harder is the hearing loop, because unless a driver has got a hearing aid with a T-switch on, then they're not going to know whether the hearing loop is working or not. Some systems have uh lights and warnings and things like that if uh the hearing loop amplifiers aren't working and things like that but that just says whether it thinks it's working not whether the information is intelligible or not and so uh, there needs to be some regular testing you know doesn't need to be done every day but it needs to be done on a regular enough basis so you know perhaps think about adding it into you know a monthly check or something like that um, you can get little um, uh, receivers uh, a bit like old style walkmans plug some headphones into it and that pretends to be uh, a hearing loop with a t-switch you can hear what's coming through you can hear whether it's intelligible or not um, and uh, and that's one of the challenges with fitting the hearing loops um, is not just the testing, but also they can become um, subject to interference, particularly on hybrid train vehicles. 
um, the heavy electrical um, currents uh, quite often create um, interference and so uh, you know the location of the loop wiring and things like that needs to be uh, thought about um, which is why you need to use uh, somebody that knows what they're doing so you need to think about fitting and, and that sort of thing and the maintenance so um, funding um, because Artic had been working with the Department of Transport for many years um, and particularly on the Bus Service Act 2017 with the open data requirements and um, providing advice and support on accessibility uh, for many years. Um, the department, um, once it had done an impact assessment, um, decided that they needed to be providing some support for the smallest operators for the cost of the audiovisual equipment. They've asked uh, Artig to uh, manage that grant process on their behalf. Um, the grant comes about because whenever there's new legislation, uh, there needs to be an impact assessment. Uh, you know, there are always winners and losers in legislation. Um, and as part of that impact assessment, it was identified that the smallest operators are the ones that have the biggest financial uh, challenges as a result of introducing the regs. Um, you know, if you uh, are a large operator and go to supplier, you know, please give me a thousand um, uh, units, um, they're going to get a different price to, you know, somebody that goes and says, give me four or five, please. Uh, and so, you know, there's a discount um, pricing uh, involved. Um, there is also uh, the need to keep the information up to date, uh, which means that, you know, you need uh, software and tools. Uh, it doesn't matter whether you've got one vehicle or a thousand, uh, you know, you've got to have that in place. And so, you know, you can't spread that cost across, uh, you know, as many vehicles and the fare boxes like to be smaller and things like that. Um, and so um, the uh, the smallest operators were identified as being uh, financially disadvantaged as a result, which is why the grant comes about. Um, to be eligible for the grant, you've got to have 20 or fewer in scope public service vehicles. Um, you might have more than 20 vehicles in your fleet. You know, you might have vehicles that are too small, so they're out of scope of the, the regulations. You might have coaches that you use for tours and holidays and things like that. They're again, you know, out of scope of the regulations. Um, so, you know, uh, if you've got more than 20 vehicles, then don't just go, mm, I'm not eligible. Um, have a think about how many vehicles you've got that are in scope of the regulations. Um, you can't be part of a bigger group because then you're almost certainly going to have more than 20 vehicles in the group. And we'd look at the group size um, and you can't already have something on board so if you've got partial compliant equipment then you're not eligible for the uh, for the grant either um, and uh, applications need to come directly from an operator um, we have designed the application process to be as simple as possible it's not like a lot of government uh, schemes where you've got a provide war and peace and all sorts of justifications and analysis and things like that. Um, we've made it as simple as possible. Um, so you don't need help doing it. Um, the purpose of the grant, what you can use it for, you can use it to buy equipment. So if you need speakers, hearing loops, displays, that sort of thing. Um, the grant to make sure it can support as many operators and vehicles as possible will only fund minimum specification equipment. So um, practically that means that 
Um, we're not going to fund an operator that's trying to buy, you know, 70 inch plasma 3D screens and surround sound audio systems for the vehicle. Uh, we will, though, uh, fund uh, LED displays um, and normal audio equipment uh, that you would put into a vehicle. Um, if an operator wants TFTs because that fits more with their branding and style and things like that, then there's nothing to stop them doing that. Uh, suppliers need to provide a quote for uh, LED, the basic, um, and that's what we will uh, reimburse people for. You know, they can then top that up for uh, TFT screens and things like that. And there's a, you know, we've got a few operators that are choosing to do that. Uh, we'll fund installation. Um, there is a challenge with uh, a number of the OEMs um, who um, have not got enough engineers to meet current demand. They've got the equipment um, in stock, but they haven't got enough engineers. And so uh, you may need to source installation from uh you know auto electricians and things like that and there's a number of third parties uh around that are doing uh a lot of the fitting and have been trained by the oems um for that um if you need supporting infrastructure so you know tools to keep the root data up to date and things like that um and we'll fund the first year's worth of maintenance um so you know basically we're trying to fund a working operational system. Um, in terms of the process, um, we're not asking for a lot of the standard public sector processes. Um, we ask that you get a quote from a supplier. Um, we are seeing everybody's quotes, of course. Um, and where we, you know, where a supplier is going, it's going to cost you fifty thousand pound, Governor, to uh, fit a vehicle. Then we are challenging that on the basis that, you know, we know what the average cost is, and so, you know, you might want to think about that price um, because there's plenty of other people that will uh, provide a better value for money. Um, there's a pretty simple grant claim form. Um, there is a uh, and that grant claim form asks for information that should be readily to hand things like what's your company name and number what's your vat number what's your bank account details and things like that um there is a uh, subsidy declaration form because this is a grant and it is classed as state aid so if you've received uh, other uh, aid packages from government and support, um, then um, there is a limit to the amount that you can receive in a three financial year period. Uh, fortunately for us, uh, most of the uh, COVID support grants and uh, particularly from authorities for, um, you know, for, for building costs and things like that, um there uh th they've timed out um so uh so very few people have received uh too much subsidy um and there are uh set of terms and conditions people have to agree to um the probably the one that's worth making aware of because the others are pretty standard um you do need to commit to uh, maintaining the equipment for five years after it's installed. Um, if you, you know, replace vehicles and things like that, the vehicle that comes in needs to be fitted, you know, either afresh and you, you know, you, you leave the kit on the outgoing vehicle or you move it between vehicles and that sort of thing. But we will be uh, auditing that and keeping an eye on that because, uh, we don't want things to be uh, fitted for a year and then disappear and fleets start to degrade and not have as many uh, uh, audiovisual kit installed. Um, in terms of timescales and things like that, the application process has been uh, open since 8th of April. Um, originally, it had been uh, intended to be open only for a couple of months because we thought everybody would rush to apply um 
we still have applications open there's not a lot of money left but there is some left still um and uh you know we're we're paying out now uh vehicles are being fit and funded uh through this so uh you know, uh going well from that point of view um any questions about the grant and processes No, if you don't know anything about the sort of equipment, what it looks like and things like that, we've got a report that's uh, available uh, that looks at some of the different technologies, uh, looks at what you might need to think about if you're planning installs, uh, what you need to do to keep it up and running uh, over the longer term. Um, so that might provide some background information. Um, all of the application forms and processes that are available on our website. We've got a set of pages on that. We've got a quick guide to the regulations, uh, links to recordings of some of these uh, sessions are there as well. And, uh, and we've got a dedicated team uh, responding to inquiries. Uh, typically, we're getting back to people in a couple of hours. Um, so, uh, so quite responsive at the moment. So, uh, yeah, that's uh, everything that I've got to uh, share with you. Uh, are there any more or any questions uh, generally? Yeah, Ozad. Just a quick one. Um, you might not have covered it when it came to the regulations. Um, when it comes to enforcement or compliance, um, who's in? Would the DVSA be in charge of that? Yeah. So it's DVSA compliance um, thing. Um, the operators, BOEM, the you know, business manager with or um, inspector, um, will uh, be doing compliance, and they're responsible. Um, uh, in terms of sanctions and things like that, it is a O license infringement issue. Um, but DVSA will work with operators um, to uh, help them understand, you know, where any problems are and shortfalls are and things like that, and help them address it um, in the uh, in the way that they do these days. You know, setting in place uh, action plans to address uh failures and things like that so you know they won't immediately take people to um public inquiries and things like that they'll work with operators uh to uh, to achieve compliance over a period of time all right thank you very much okay if there's nothing else then uh thank you for your time this afternoon uh, my contact details are on the screen if you didn't know them already. Um, thank you for joining and hope you have a good rest of the day. Thank you for watching this Artig webinar. To find out more about Artig and our work, then please visit our website at rtig.org.uk. Thank you. Mm -hmm.